Hello, everybody, and Hello. welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. We are live and going to discuss with you today writing an ensemble cast, um, which is a super, super fun topic. Uh, briefly, what we're talking about is when you have a lot of prominent characters in a film. Um, I think we might, pro we're probably going to stick to film today. We might break into TV a little bit, but we're talking about things like Little Miss Sunshine, where you have the whole cast of characters in the car. We're talking about the Goonies, where you have like a group of kids going into a cave and shiz, trying to get a treasure or whatever they're trying to do. Um, basically that, where you have a group of people. This is particularly common in heist movies, things like that, um, where... You have a group of people who are trying to get to an objective together. And we are going to distinguish that from having multiple protagonists at some point in this conversation. Right. I think this is a huge topic with a lot of variation. And um, there, because, you know, there are ensemble films like, say, Magnolia that are like interweaving storylines, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, the term ensemble, from my point of view, really is more of like a billing sort of thing. It's yeah. like how the, the film is marketed. Like Grand Budapest Hotel is a great example. It's like, okay, you see the poster and here are like 10 faces. These are all people who are going to have moments that are worthwhile, right? Like from the point of view of like, oh, um, you know, famous actor I like is in this. I'll go see it, right? Um, even if they only have a minor part or more of a supporting uh, role. So it's the way I would think of it is sort of like, okay, this is a story, the large cast of characters who all have important moments and aren't like secondary to one person, one character's uh, point of view. And I think there's a lot of variation, right? Where you could have like Little Miss Sunshine, which is like, okay, it's the family, but like, it's really about the dad. And, you know, a movie like Magnolia, I don't know if you've seen that, but like, nope. you could make a case that there are six protagonists in that movie, right? You could make a case. Um, it's also three hours long. So it's like six interweaving, interweaving uh, storylines that have nothing to do with each other, except that they interweave. Um, Makes sense. I'm also thinking of films like Knives Out. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of films like, <laughs> I was just rewatching it, Rat Race, a classic 90s. So like like the, the core premise of Knives Out, Rat Race, is that there is a clear objective, whether it's uh, solve the murder or it's get the suitcase of money in the locker, but all of the characters either are involved with that or connected to it. And even in Little Miss Sunshine, it's like, we all need to get to Redondo Beach and they all have a stake in it. Uh, in Little Miss Sunshine, it's all of the, 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 the one person that they all agree is not a shitty person and they like, they want to make something nice happen for her, right? Uh, right. Knives Out, it's, oh my God, I could be, I don't want to get, I don't, I don't want to get pinned for this murder, you know? And, and also from the audience point of view, like, which one of these people did it, right? So all whodunits are, are ensembles, right, in the sense. Yeah, for sure. That's a great point. So that's the kind of genres that, you know, tend to have a, tend to be ensemble. Um, it's a lot of like, also like adventure stuff. You get a lot of ensemble, um, like groups of people trying to go accomplish. Oh, look, Adam. Somebody's asking me what? a question about my life. I, uh, I played bagpipes <laughs> was my first instrument. Oh God! And you have a piano behind you. I think that's why. This yeah, yeah. I play. Up. I I I hack away at the piano, but I am actually relative intermediate level uh, guitar <laughs> player, um, intermediate level bagpipe player, rudimentary piano player. Uh, I'm not very good, but I like I play in the sense of like best. I play to sort of understand music theory if that makes sense because the piano makes more logical sense. But like if you ask me, hey, Adam, impress me. I'll go play Bach on the P on the guitar and I'll impress you for maybe two pieces. And then you'll see, I run out of material. Um, it's a hobby. It's a, Fair you know, enough. Yeah. yeah. When you start young at anything, you just sort of like hours just accumulate. Like I started in fifth grade with guitar in second grade. No, no, sorry. Fourth grade with bagpipes. I was up to the point where I actually couldn't play. Because of, like, I was too grader. small. I was too small Aww. to actually play the Highland pipes. So it would make me pass out because of the air. Yeah, so that was a very detailed an uh, answer to, but that has nothing to do with uh, ensemble comedies or stories. No. Let's talk about Rat Race a lot because I just watched it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am unfamiliar. And for the you've never person... seen Rat Race, it's no. it's 
it's surprisingly good. So he's got all star cast. You've got um, Seth Green, you've got John Cleese, Rowan Atkinson, you have Whoopi Goldberg, Cuba Gooding, like uh, the guy from Newman from Seinfeld. You've got uh, like it's like all these people from the '90s. You're like, oh yeah. Oh, and also the band Smash Mouth is in the movie. I love Smash end. Mouth. But wow. they're in the movie as a plot point at a comedy, and they play All Star, of course, and that's how they end the song. It's so '90s, it like hurts your face. But um, the thing that Man. I like about that as an ensemble film, just to tie it back, is that every single one of those stars has a moment that's important, or like ha is like has good. Like you would not be disappointed if you went to the, see that movie back or and you liked one of those people, right? It's yeah, not like, I'm oh, they were in there for like Zendaya Sorry. in a, in a Dune, right? <laughs> yeah. So real quick, I need to, for some reason to share my screen, I'm going to need to close Chrome. So I will be right back. And no worries, so you can talk close, about close, rot, close race, Chrome. get it all. No, no, system. I already did. I, I just expected it. <laughs> Oops. You got me out. <laughs> I hit remove. Well, okay, there we go. There's Alexi. Wait, this is a pertinent quote. I associate acoustic guitars with youth, Christian powder, uh, pastors, and those guys in college. That's a very sad association. See, like my uh, my dad is a deeply talented classical guitar player. And so like when my first exposure to it was like, oh, Segovia, Bach, like, uh, you know, progressive rock bands that would do like, you know, the nylon string, not strumming energy. So like I was only exposed to that way later when I realized the negative connotation were like, oh, guitar is not like this virtuoso athletic, uh, you know, classical music thing. Uh, but it's actually, you know, got the wonder wall uh, damage. Sorry, the only one per, let's get back to the talking about movies. So like, I think it's kind of weird to think about things in terms of an ensemble. Like if, I think a better maybe ter word or term would be to think about it in terms of, you know, <laughs> this is every role would be exciting to an actor of that type, right? Like, because I think that's important to think about anyway when you're writing material. You want, because you want like your lead role at the very least to like a star, somebody who could finance the movie hypothetically. Um, and for, sure. for an ensemble movie, you want to be like, wow, these are a lot of great parts. I'd be excited for that side part. I'd be excited for that. Um, if mm -hmm. assuming somebody's work, uh, good for it. So Adam, how would you distinguish, this is a random question. How would you distinguish a, just like a regular cast of characters from an ensemble? Like, you know, you can, you can have just like a bunch of characters in your movie probably will. How do you, what makes yeah. that different than an ensemble? I actually, I, uh, I have a good answer for that, I think. Ooh. Um, so <laughs> my hypothesis is the core situation like whether it's the inciting incident, the, the, the spark that like starts the conflict in the movie, the core dramatic situation involves the group rather than involving in, in, is specific to one person's uh, experience, right? Like, you know, like the classic change arc movie, uh, Hollywood movie starts with, you know, okay, we meet a character in their normal world and their flaw, and then an inciting incident disrupts that normal world and they're set off on an adventure. The distinction I think between like a movie called an ensemble film would be that same phenomena happens, but when we enter the normal world, we meet the family, we meet the group, we meet the cast, of, the, the family that's going to be complicit, we meet the everyone and the inciting incident disrupts not just the protagonist but the status quo for the group um and if you're doing multiple storylines you'd have every single storyline would have that phenomena happening um so that's the mm -hmm. distinction i'd make that it would have to be the situation would have to affect the group so i like taking notes as we go and i'm trying to make right. it look prettier than just the google doc so doing it in a slide um but these were some of the topics that i thought about um that I thought we should hit on today, Adam. Yeah. Uh, Adam, would you say that Reservoir Dogs is considered an ensemble? Yes. Uh, personally, I and I also think that, so, so first of all, by that definition I gave, um, you have the crime goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You have this group of individuals, I think it's six or eight individuals are undertaking a crime. The crime goes wrong and they all deal with the fallout. It, the situation affects the whole group and the group all has a stake in the situation. Um, I think you could make the argument that uh, 
who's the protagonist of that movie? I haven't seen it in a while. Mr. Orange, maybe. Um, or Harvey Keitel's character, Mr. White. One of them is the probably the protagonist. Um, but it, but it's... It. picture it. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's Tarantino, so you wouldn't like it. Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen it, though. It's it's. I think it's one of his tighter movies in the sense that it's mm. ninety minutes. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, in that sense, yes, I would say it's a it's a ensemble because you know you you're seeing it for the whole cast. Although I do think this is a very weighted towards Javi Clytel. Like you you have a sense that when you're watching it, he's the the big name. Um, yeah. Also, this is like a spectrum. Like I think like. It's not like a categorical, this is ensemble, this is not ensemble. It's more of like an impression of like how the audience like is like absorbing the story and the promise of the story and what's interesting about it. Um, For sure. Yeah, like I think at some point, that's that's a good note because at some point, you know, it's, they function very similarly to every other character in your movie. Like if someone's going to have a presence in your movie, they should tick the same boxes as people in your ensemble, which I want to get into in a second. Um, but it's just a matter of, do they feel central? Um, yes. Do they have their own? Typically, I think that not always, but in a lot of ensembles, people have their own objectives. Um, they're not just there kind of floating around the protagonist's objective. They have their own thing that they're actively trying to do. And that to me might be the most distinguishing factor is are they just there? Yes. Or are they actively pursuing their own goal um so and ocean's 11 like is a great example yeah uh, like and from every conceivable sense you would you, when you see i uh, said the, the remake with george clooney and brad pitt not the um original with uh the rat pack the uh, ocean's 11 it's like okay wow these are 14 15 actors who either you know their face or you know their name um they're all in it together whether or not they are trying to undertake the heist or they're affected by the heists and they're a victim right but you would never have a moment of ambiguity that this movie is about george clooney's character danny ocean and brad pitt's character and julie roberts although i i feel like she's more interesting in the later films like would they they develop uh her and um uh danny's relationship more i'm not the biggest oceans love event i'm just that was just a it's a really clean example um oceans are fun yeah, they are. It's fun. Um, he doesn't love a heist. So, yeah. so uh, let's think for a moment. Adam, where do you want to start? What to give each character or the conversation about protagonists versus is an ensemble just a bunch of protagonists and that whole whole deal? Well, what do you think? Let's, talk, let's talk about protagonists and multiple protagonists. Cool. I, I think functionally in a... In a <laughs> the average... I mean, I mean average in, a, in an aspirational in the sense of just by the number, 98% of movies that are released, especially American movies, are designed around a change arc around a single protagonist, even ensemble movies. The character arc, the fundamental one that is like associated with like our point of empathy through the movie in Ocean's Eleven is Danny Ocean, you know, and his relationship with uh, A, uh, his you know, his life with crime and also the person, the person he loves, Julie Roberts character, who I don't remember the character name. And in uh, Knives Out, it's uh, Marta, Anna de Armas's character in uh, <laughs> Rat Race. <laughs> so Rat Race, I think actually doesn't do a very good change arc, but they try really half-heartedly to make it about this guy who's like this stuck up lawyer. And he's like, you know, well, you know, maybe I'll, no, I don't want to gamble. I don't want to do anything. You know, and then he becomes a risk taker. But it's so in the background, it's so weak. You kind of even forget that they, it's like that you forget it happens. I don't think it actually is a good example, but um, nobody else has any arc. They're all just greedy from the beginning. And actually I feel like that movie is an interesting example in the sense of it, it, it's an, it's a feels emotionally satisfying because the situation's resolved, but nobody really meaningfully changes. The only reason, I won't spoil it yet, but it's good. Uh, but the core, but the character arc is oh, super yeah. soft and doesn't really work. But you would say that the writers positioned this person as the protagonist in Act One, and then they forgot about it. But they still tried, right? You know, um, there's always going to be a single in an American. The average Hollywood film is going to center on one person's change arc, even if, 
lots of characters are important and even to the in terms of equal screen time. So for sure. And I think Sorry, I an example, no, no, it's totally true. So basically, I guess to sum up, it's that even within an ensemble cast, you'll still probably most likely in most American, at least films, Hollywood films have one protagonist that is the main person within your ensemble. And that person is going to follow all the different, um, all the ticks that we always talk about for protag protagonists. So yes. they're going to be the one with the flaw, slowing everything down on their way to the objective. They're going to be the one who has the tangible, specific, timely, and important objective throughout the entire film. It's going to matter to them most. They're also going to be the person who is taking um, direct action towards towards that objective. So they might be telling someone like, hey, you need to go cut the lights. You need to do this. But they're the person in the heist who is, who is in charge, who is the one that we're following. Um, and then I would say also they are the ones who hold the emotional journey. So when we hit the all is lost moment, at, towards the end of uh, right at the very beginning of act three and they hit their lowest point that's the character who's in the lowest point um and other characters to some degree might go through these steps but this is really it's really them if you break it down if you look at who we're following and who's driving the action um adam says six to eight that's just um, my gut feeling um, for the my reason gut feeling being, is a little lower is my gut feeling, but I guess it depends you, on the, if you really level. count, if you really count like the number of faces on the poster of little miss sunshine, it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's about, it's more, it's, it's more than four. Mm -hmm. Like I would I also just call anything less than six is just like a typical movie. I don't know. Cause little women. Is, women. Yeah, that's an ensemble, but it's really about the family of five. I th yeah, but I mean, it's about, yeah. but I think that there's, it's still an ensemble in my mind. It's still around. six main characters, six main characters. At least. Is it six? I thought it was five. Yeah, you got Timothy Chalamet's character. Oh, got, him. Um, oh, no, but he's part of the Extra. ensemble. Is he? He's part of it. No, it's, but it's part of the, it's part of the <laughs> ensemble. It's part of the ensemble. Like in terms of main characters who like, oh, that's a good role that I'd be interested in. It's oh. you've got the family. And you like, but that's how I see it. Like, yeah. In my mind, I would only consider somebody part of the ensemble if they have their own um, partial track in the film. So like if they have their own objective, if they have their own flaw that they're going to overcome. His character like, definitely they, has that in that movie. I don't remember that. I don't remember him. I was very focused on uh, Saoirse. I've, 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 oh, seen, Saoirse. The movie. I've seen the Florence. movie. I've seen the movie four times, so I know. Why? Why I, like, would you do that? I, the first two wow. times I was paying attention. The next I was like, okay, how did this work? Because I can't actually, mm -hmm. I have to watch it once or twice before I can actually analyze it because I'm very weak and I get swept up in the story. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I have to watch it twice too. I usually try to watch the first time for enjoyment and try not to pay too much attention to like, what are they doing? Even though it happens automatically. And then if I watch a second time, I'm like, okay, now I want to know how they did it like i want to yeah. know why this worked and i normally only do it for my favorite movies so. but I, the reason why i push back a little bit on the sense of like oh it's the core i think antagonist is always part of an ensemble in, in like an ensemble really? like they're part of the dynamic they're part of the hmm. emotional context of the story like it's you, you because you you also want because you don't want to lose the balance of characters right like there's a dramatic situation who are all of the and what are all of the polarity shifts and energies inside of that? And an antagonist is arguably as important as the protagonist. You don't want to have a, like a tertiary antagonist that doesn't really affect the core dynamic relationships of the story, right? Um, yeah. So that's that's the only the reason I push back. So like those characters, you'd be like, well, they're not part of the family, but they're part of the main story and the plot. You'd think of them in terms of they affect the dynamic. Um, yeah, so, that's But about true. this number thing, the one thing I want to, uh, push on is like, you don't want to arrive to that number arbitrarily, right? If you're the number of characters you have should come from the needs of the story always. And the, when you're thinking about terms like, oh, ensemble, it's more to just sort of make sure, are these all good roles? Are they all compelling? Is there yeah. like a good dynamic relationship 
for every character? Does every character want something? Does every do I have redundant characters? Like, or do I have two characters who have the, the, kind of the same emotional damage? Should I combine them? Right. Those are the sort of things yep. we're trying to bring up in this conversation. And I agree with Michelle here. I think that this is just a different version of what you were saying. Now it's like it's based on your tone. Um, it's based on the needs of the story, how many people you have, and and I think Adam, you were saying this before, uh, maybe. I think, yeah, we were saying it when I was getting set up, but there is benefit to thinking of anything as you do as an ensemble. If you're thinking about it, like these roles need to be dynamic enough that somebody would want it. Yeah. Um, but, but for now we're talking about like, not just like that. We're talking about, they have a substantial place in the movie for right now. You know like what roles role. always get, what, what part would characters always get like shallow, uh, treatments, the best friends, the yep. best friends who listen to the problems of the protagonist. Those are always shallow characters and people should push for better. Um, but like, yeah. like th things like that, that just sort of like roles and characters that, em that emerge from necessity of plot. Those are the ones who you want to like consciously consider because it's usually, you want every role to count. You want every everything to be important. So Chris says, I'm working on an idea for a narrative soap opera podcast and I have, if I remember correctly, six characters. It's a parody of daytime soaps, but with traits of shows like Succession. So that's super cool. I think yeah, podcasts cool. are very smart right now. I've, I've, I've gone on about this before, but I think it's a very smart thing to write because you can get it made easy and then have something, I say easy, relatively simply, and you can have something to show of your work. Um, when we actually in writer's room, we're working on working on an audio drama right now slash podcast. The thing about that makes podcasts a little bit trickier with ensembles is just making sure that you're considering how many voices you're going to have since we don't have the, uh, the visual difference. Like we completely don't have the visuals. You're going based on tone. And so I think that even more so than in TV, you want to make sure that every single character has earned their place and needs to be there. Um, has like a very different perspective. Is like a very unique character. No, but they can't sound the same. Um, you know, you probably you have a character have... called Bert and a character called Kurt, and they have the same sounding voice and their same type of actor and same age on a podcast that'll be really hard for people to distinguish. For example, for sure. Um, let's see. Oh, so here, let's bring up this question again. Are there usually one multiple in, in an ensemble? So usually there's one. Um, and then you kind of can think about the other one as like baby protagonists. Like they have their own stuff going on in an ensemble. They have their own inner life, their own things that they want. They have their own flaw. But you have one actual protagonist of your film. Like it is, it is, someone, <clears throat> it is someone's story most, if that makes sense. And yeah. maybe we should circle to the thematic question because I think that that's, to me, a really important well, one part. One thing I want to define just our oh, use yeah. of protagonist really quickly. When we use the word protagonist, we don't just mean main central character. We mean the character who has agency in the story in the, certain, in the sense of like they are, they are the catalyst of like driving the plot forward. And yeah. the inciting incident happens to them. Yes. And they change along the way of the story. So like those are those are like some core attributes that we use define protagonists by. You could have really excuse me, you could have really great core characters who really matter in the story, but no, don't actually fulfill that function. And I think a lot of people, especially beginning writers, one of the first mistakes they make is they make passive protagonists who aren't actually protagonists because it's not their story. They they make another character way more interesting um, and dynamic mm -hmm. and have a more dramatic uh, situation. I would say that by our by the definition John uses and we use and everything like that, the a protagonist is the engine of your narrative. Yeah. And so by definition, you you have one. They are the engine of the narrative. Like who is truly moving this? Who is the one who's truly who this happened to? Who's the one whose stakes are the highest? Um, perspective do we have? Um, Let's just answer this really question before quick before we go. Uh, so why are BFF stress shallow? Do they regurgitate or prelude what the story is about? I think it's it happens mostly because those 
uh, those roles are written by necessity to be like a sounding board for the protagonist rather than a character with wants and needs in you know and of themselves and agency. <laughs> it's the it's the replacement for the inner monologue of a novel. Yeah, say. totally. Because like, I mean, so that I, this is said where a a book is about your inner life, um, like the internal thoughts. A play is about the dialogue and a film is about action and so a lot of times um it's hard to express inner thoughts through action it's not impossible people do it really really well but um you know it's it's tricky to have inner thoughts expressed through action and so a lot of times you see people using a secondary character as a crutch where literally they have no other life other than just for the protagonist to share their inner life with them so that the audience can absorb it. They're just there as a proxy for the audience to get the information they need. And I mean, there have been successful films that do that. I think in general, I'm going to blaspheme, blasphemize, blaspheme. One of my favorite commit films. Commit blasphemy. Commit blasphemy. Be blasphemous about there Juno. Is. Because I think that her best friend in that, I love that movie, but I think that her best friend, um, that Juno's best friend in that film is basically just a proxy for the audience so that we can have a conversation and understand what's going on inside of Juno's head. But I want to push back on one thing against what I, the premise of this is sort of like, I think Ooh. there's sometimes, sometimes it's you sometimes you need a character to fulfill a function, right? To yeah. make something work right like and sometimes it's like well we need that conversation and you know you understand that it's a necessary evil to sort of have like a two-dimensional character you know yet we but we want to push for everything to that exists to be realized and earned right yeah i think it i think that there's a really really subtle difference between sometimes between having a character who is literally just a sounding board for your protagonist and then giving them just like a little bit more like, I don't yeah. think it needs to be, like, a complete, like, radical rewrite necessarily of these characters. I think a lot of times it's just considering their perspective a little bit more. Um, making sure that they offer something to the plot besides just a way for characters to get out their thoughts. Like, are they also giving some kind of, like, moral guidance? Like, are they offering, like, an opposite point of view? Are they an obstacle? Are they an ally? Like, what else are they doing besides just being there? as a as a vent for your character um Let's oh good i'm glad question. chris yes so thematic question which actually ties into what chris was talking about um oh yeah that makes sense michelle i agree um so thematic question this is something we talked about before but it is always relevant and especially in ensemble stuff. So a lot of times when we talk about theme in a book or in English class or something like that, people talk about theme as just like a uh, seize the day, theme is family, theme are like these like big like open-ended things that are the, the theme. The, that in our experience and John's experience, it tends to be hard <laughs> to effectively use a theme when you're thinking about it like that. When you're thinking about like family or the theme is brothers or the theme is, you know, money's not everything. All these different things about, about the theme where it's just stated like that um, is hard to write about. Um, it's hard to build characters that are interesting about that. It's it's just very vague and open. So what we encourage people to do instead is to think about theme as a thematic question. So what is a question that is at the heart of your story? Um, you know, Adam, do you want to do an expand yeah, a little bit? Here's an example. Like maybe maybe a question, a possible dramatic question would be. Um, this is just off the top of my head. What do you do? when your dreams don't come true and what what how do you deal with failure right like that's a question mm. that's a real that's a question one. that gets to drama right and i think the best thematic questions best the best thematic questions create drama right to and you want to think like okay here's a situation 
And what can I, how can I really access the emotional damage of all these characters? Like, what do you do when things don't happen? What do you do when you fail? How do we deal with failure? And every character in that story, a hypothetical story, could have a different answer for that question. I think the thematic question of uh, Little Miss Sunshine is something like, in a world where you're either a winner or a loser, <laughs> who are you, right? Yeah. Right. So like in the whole question is like the, the whole character arc of the main dad is like, oh, we're winners. We're all going to be winners. Every member of my family is going to be a winner. And they all have to confront that they've all failed in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And it's that whole story is about them accepting failure and it's saying, actually, it's OK. I'm a loser and I love you. Right. Like that's a that's a really rich, dramatic cluster mm -hmm. of uh, ideas. Sorry, I'm rambling. No, it's good. I think, yeah, I would phrase, I think I would phrase Little Miss Sunshine something like, what is winning? Like, what does it mean to win? Like, what does it mean to be a winner? Yeah, something it's simpler, like that. it's simpler. Yeah, something like that, where everybody in that whole, or how do you respond to failure even, I think might actually be closer to what it is, because every single person in the bus is dealing with yeah, it. How different. do you respond to failure? But like, yeah. you, you want it to be something that, like, this is a this is a gray area, right? Like this is not a science. Like you want the question to inspire you, and mm -hmm. make you think about the characters in a deeper way. But the same story, right? Like if it's one singular question, you're in the same page with all the characters, right? You won't have a um, a, a secondary plot line that has nothing really to do with um, or that's like feels kind of out of place. You want your stories, especially for feature screenplays, to feel of a piece, and this is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so that that is where we get into ensemble casts. Um, you know that you want your protagonist to have an answer to the thematic question at the beginning of the movie. And as they overcome their flaw and, dis and you know, fulfill their inner need, they have a new answer to that question. So at the beginning of how do you handle failure, one could be literally never, ever, ever give up, persist no matter what. You cannot accept failure. And then by the end of the movie, this character could learn, you know, sometimes you do fail and that's okay. It like, it's the people you meet along the way that matter. Something like that. Like some sort of statement of belief where they change. So uh, the protagonist definitely has a relationship to this them thematic question. Um, and the antagonist does. The antagonist is going to have an answer to this question that is different than the protagonist's. The mentor is going to guide the protagonist towards their correct answer to this thematic question. And in an ensemble, the strongest ensemble tend to have characters who each have a different answer to this thematic question. And so in that way, they are tied to the core of the movie. And they're building the core of the movie rather than just kind of like flying around in space and being, you know, extra. If you want to justify why is this character in the movie which, you know, you have to justify everything in your movie. Having them have an answer to your thematic question and be an important part of your protagonist figuring out their own answer is, uh, is a good way to do that. Definitely. I think <laughs> kind of what you were saying about, like, you know, making sure that every element is, is uh, thoughtful and intentional. The enemy of, story, of good storytelling is arbitrary choices, right? Like, and at the end, you, but when you're starting off a story, you, you were by necessity, you're going to be making arbitrary choices. Oh, what if it takes place in a school, right? What if it takes, what if, uh, what if the mom has cancer? You know, like you're, you're asking <laughs> questions sort of yeah. to find the thing. And this is where that uh, really clumsy sculpting metaphor takes place. But like this thematic question is a way to find unity and consistency, right? And it's, it's just one way into it. Like this is a very outside in kind of, way to sort of find out like, well, what's the, uh, what's the emotional truth of these characters and what are they going to learn? Like a lot of people, uh, discovery writers famously would be like, well, I'm going to write a whole draft just to find out those things. This is just one way to just ask yourself, like, because I, I highly advise front loading and outlining for screenwriting because the, yeah. the, the form is so weighted to action and not dialogue or inner monologue. Um, but this is a way to sort of find the core character arc. And at the end of the day, this is like the other side of the coin. The thematic question is the other side of the coin of the flaw and her need, 
of the protagonist, right? Mm -hmm. Because the thematic question has to fit the character arc. You're not going to have a thematic question that has nothing. Like if you have a story about what does it mean to be a loser? What do you do? <laughs> what does it mean to be a loser or to be a winner? Uh, something like that. You wouldn't have the character arc be, he goes from selfless to self, self, he goes from selfish to selfless. Like, oh, he learns to care about, you know, share money, right? Like there's, there, I mm -hmm. there's so many beginning screenwriters who like actually pick that very specific ones. Oh, he's a selfish bastard in the beginning, but then he becomes generous at the end. So, okay. But like, is that the story? You know, and thematic yeah. question is a way of connecting. Okay. What's like the situation? What is kind of the thematic idea behind the situation? How do I tie that? to the emotional damage of the protagonist as they grow and change and become who they are at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I want to kind of use this to trans transition into the last question that I have on there. Can they be consolidated? Which is always a question to ask yourself. So the personal objectives and the thematic question? No, no, no. Can the characters do you have too many characters oh, yes, yes, yes. and can you mash some together and how do you decide who is strong enough on their own to justify yeah. their existence in the movie and how do you decide when you have two characters that really just need to be one yeah um, it's common and that is a tough one um because i mean you could take it too far and be like the most practical there is probably a way that I could make this movie like nearly a one man show. Like, you know, like you have to think about what you want and really balance like what's necessary to tell the ver best version of your story with getting lost in the weeds of just like enjoying having all these people that you've made around. Um, how would you tackle the sighting if they earn their spot or if they should be cut or consolidated we well, have to imagine well okay if i remove this character what would happen to the story and mm -hmm. if the answer is oh i just have to change this bit of dialogue they're not important <laughs> right. yeah that's a simple way if to the check answer it. <laughs> is oh god i have to rewrite all of act one and act two and what's going to happen well then maybe okay maybe they're actually in the infrastructure of the story right like uh <laughs> i honestly uh, there are lots of cameo roles in Wes Anderson movies that could have been totally cut and you would have never noticed, right? Like, th th not to say that, mm -hmm. that that is necessary. You can have great films that have maybe more of a maximalist, we're going to have all these characters sort of thing, but like the average impulse of a Hollywood producer is for every character I cut, we're going to have a cheaper movie. Um, <laughs> like, think you, you, yeah. you know, people are going to be thinking from that point of view and, you know, <laughs> you can, if, he, if you can combine the two best friends and the one best friend, sometimes that's that's a good thing to do but like it really has to come from if you're getting rid of character does it affect the core dramatic situation does it make it less interesting does it make it more compelling you know like it's sort of making sure that you're not being arbitrary because you can always get rid of arbitrary characters but you can't always get rid of characters who are like integrated into the story mm -hmm. um that makes sense i think what's more common, what you're going to have happen more often rather than cutting a character fully is you're going to run into the thing where you could say, I could consolidate these two. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean that like you've made characters that are identical. They could be very, very different. You kind of need to pick a side to go. What that means is that their story function is basically the same. Not that they as a character are the same. Typically when characters can be consolidated, they aren't doing something for the story that is unique. Um, so are they both mentoring your protagonist in yes. the same direction? Like, are they, are they, you know, are they both bullying the protagonist in the same way? Like in what is their relationship to the protagonist and is it the same? That would be a question I would ask, um, to decide if they should be consolidated or not. And I also think it ties into the core, this idea that we always talk about of complexity versus depth in yeah. a story right like um for every character you add for every plot line you add for every idea you add you're adding complexity to the story and complexity is sometimes really engaging it's like oh the interplay of ideas a situation that develops um development plot expansion like sometimes complexity is really what engages but for every element of complexity in terms of the choice of care how many characters you bring in you are sacrificing depth the simpler the mm -hmm. story, the more 
depth you can achieve with the characters. And I, I'd say most of the time, depth is more important. I think people overestimate the value of complexity in their own work. And most people probably better serve to simply tell good stories with great characters. That being said, there are some awesome movies that have very shallow characters or relatively shallow characters, but like the, the ideas at play, the theme, like it, it works. I think Rat Race is actually a great example. You don't yeah. really, you, like, uh, just, I'm just going to do minor spoilers. I won't say the end, but like, <laughs> you know absolutely nothing about Rowan Atkins' character other than he's vaguely European, maybe Spaniard, and he's a narcoleptic. He has no friends or family. That's all you know really about him. He's just kind of silly. Uh, uh, you know, um, Whoopi Goldberg, her daughter, they've reconnected after so long. And this is the first thing that they are doing together is this thing. That's all you really know. But from the beginning to the end, that's, that's it. They don't make any choices really that are substantial about their character. Even the protagonist, he falls in love with this pilot, helicopter pilot woman who's like, you know, kind of intense and makes him take risks. That's it. I just said the whole character. Well, there's nothing deeper, right? But at the end of the day, okay, well, we have six plot lines, all of these characters. And it's about the yep. idea. It's not it, like you're watching this movie not to like really understand like, wow, they learned so much while looking for this, uh, you know, $3 million cash or whatever it was. It was about kind of the farcical, like fun of watching all of this chaos of like, people are going after, they're on a race from Las Vegas to California. Who gets there first, right? Like the, the interplay of ideas. There is a theme about like, oh, they give away the money at the end, but it's bullshit. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, I, I think that that's a very rare type of movie. I want to talk briefly about Inception because we haven't talked about Inception in a Inception is not time. an ensemble, in my opinion. Not Ooh, really. It's a very standard central. I mean, okay, you could say that there is an ensemble, like it's, he has a team, but we don't, yeah. but we have a lot of depth with his character, we know a lot about uh, Cobb. He has huge yeah, change that's what, yeah. in his head the whole time. Exactly. I think that, that, that that's kind of where I'm, what I'm thinking about this is that, you know, I think that technically, yes, it's an ensemble cast film. Yes, if it, you is, were it gonna, is. If, if you got this script handed to you, you'd say, okay, it's an ensemble cast. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But, but not as much as Ocean's Eleven. No, no. But so in... in Inception, you have this core team of people revolving around the singular protagonist. Heist. Um, yeah, it's a heist. And the idea behind all this stuff is super complex, right? Um, and Adam, maybe you disagree, but you know, we have to have entire sequences where Elliot Page's character is showing us, like where Ho Cobb, Cobb is showing um, what's Elliot Page's character? Ariadne. Ariadne is showing Ariadne how to manipulate the world and like the way that this world is tricky and things like that. We have to have those scenes because this is a complex exposition yeah. idea. We need the yeah, exposition. Right. And the more time that we spend in this expositional state, the less time we get to spend, for example, knowing more about Ariadne. Right. right. And, and I, also, or, I think that in that particular movie, um, there are, there are sort of two dimension there are two spectrums at play one is the plot complexity mm -hmm. which is extremely co complex movie for an average hollywood <laughs> movie and yep. character right yep almost every single significant emotional scene is about one person yep and i think something that's important for us to say though is that i freaking love inception inception's a wonderful movie when you're choosing complexity versus depth yeah. It's not bad to choose complexity and it's not no. bad to choose depth. It's just it's important to know what you're doing because at the end of the day, if you were going to try to add more depth to Inception, you'd need a freaking like two more hours. I, I would, you I know, like add, I would also add maybe uh, a clear way to sort of distinguish this is sort of like there you can add complexity and depth to two tracks. One is character development and one is plot. Right. So inception, you never want to have complexity of both elements. Yeah. Right. Like so you choose that, to have yeah. complex character relationships, like, and uh, here's a great example. Uh, marriage story has an extremely simple plot, but 
but really complex character development and relationships um, between like it's a, they go really deep with the relationship and it's like a lot of a bandwidth is about like, the why of their their disintegrating marriage and stuff whereas you know Inception has a pretty uh they folk they go deep they go simple with the characters but uh complex with the plot I don't know yeah I think that's just maybe a better good way to think about it no that is true that is true I just think I think it's definitely important to remember that you know, it's not bad to have like fun, complex worlds where like you have to learn the rules and do all this stuff. Like, yeah, I, yeah, love, I love that shit. Nothing wrong with that, but it you it is important to register the balance of what does this mean? And for Inception, what it meant is, okay, I can't go deep really with anybody but Cobb. Yes, I need to go fully into Cobb because I do not have time to think about i don't have time to little women this plot you know like we're not gonna go see what they're all doing in their personal lives this is gonna be about a really, really complicated world and Cobb going deep into that character yeah um and i, I will just say that. one more time if you're writing your first screenplay ever you should choose you 100 percent should choose a simple plot with deep characters like that's a good that that's please good. go learn to write a screenplay doing that you will get you will thank yourself in the future um simple plots can be great they really work and it does not it, it almost always is better in terms of like the average viewer experience too like it's it's very challenging to do a complex plot uh for your first screenplay i'm trying to think if i did that i like made up a very complicated world the plot well, you very do science simple. fiction a lot so yeah science so. fiction by necessity <laughs> Is yeah. actually, I think all good science fiction stories, or the vast majority of science fiction stories, have complicated world building, plot information, exposition. Like, you know, it's kind of like the idea of like in a in a courtroom contemporary drama. You can have a shot of a courtroom, and everyone will know what, where they are, and the average viewer, and he will know where they are and what is happening. If you go to a science fiction uh, courtroom with special, you know mind reading devices you have to have the characters explaining hey that's what this box is and this is what we're doing and this is like you've you've, you've just got to balloon out uh you know sort of the information flow because yeah. human beings you know we 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 understand the world we live in we yeah don't it's need like to when the courtroom is in dune when she brought out the yeah. freaky toaster and told the timothy box. put yeah. his hand in it yeah the <laughs> Are you human? Carl's laughing at me. Um, but yeah, we had we didn't know what that was, and we had to spend a long like we didn't immediately see this box pull out and go, "Oh no, it's the box!" You know, you had to like, it's the toaster. It's the toaster. And, um, and one of the first conversations in the movie gets sort of some expositional energy. Uh, sorry, expositional medicine out of the way, right? Being like, mm -hmm. "How was your training?" Oh, not now, mother. Being like, "Come on, uh, use the voice." <laughs> She puts them and then he's like, then it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, but like the, the whole scene is to just say, hey, we're in the future and this guy has secret powers. And then you sort of understand everything sort of builds from there piece by piece. But like, and that's actually, I think, a really good example of it. But science fiction needs that stuff. Whereas if it was a mm -hmm. contemporary story and it was just a mother and a son having a, a dinner, we could focus more on other things. We don't need to explain what the powers are. We don't need to explain that there's uh, what spice is. We don't need to explain political drama necessarily mm -hmm. so adam i feel like you have opinions on this because why not we're almost at the yeah, end so I, might I do. As well. still haven't seen the new <laughs> dune but the book and david lynch are great here's my opinion um Eleanor. <laughs> uh, when the second dune movie comes out watch the first one first and then go see the second one so for a double feature because the first one is like just first half of the book and it cuts really awkwardly you sh they're both the the first one is really good really mm -hmm. good but don't watch it if you can help it until the new one comes out so you can be fresh i will say the book is uh, i'm a huge fan of the book uh huge david lynch fan not a big fan of the david lynch movie personally but yeah i think sting in a speedo <laughs> sting is in a, a speedo <laughs> really <laughs> well, yeah wait you didn't know about this no. So Sting 
the pop star from the police, every breath you take, Mr. Mr. Every breath you take is, uh, he's the Harkonnen main villain. He's the nephew of, uh, the big Baron. And then he has a knife fight with Kyle McLaughlin in a speedo at some, no, not, he has a scene where he's in a speedo, but he has a knife fight with him later, the end of the film. It's like, he was like, why is what? Sting in this movie? Why is Sting <laughs> in this movie? That. Like, I keep having this thought. Like, I, first of all, I really like Sting. I'm, I am a, I love that shit. Oh, Adam, real quick, restate your opinion. What was my opinion? Uh, oh. Eleanor's Green Froze, real quick. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. The new Dune movie is amazing. You have to see it. But wait until the second one comes out so you can watch them both back to back. That's the way to go. As someone who had never read Dune, seen Dune, none of that, and went with Adam to see Dune, um, I I really, really enjoyed it. I thought that it was really well done. I thought that it was like beautiful to look at. I think it was well casted, really well done. I think the narrative is actually kind of like, so far the narrative has kind of been like underwhelming, like the character development and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, um, but I was willing to go along for the ride because of how interesting everything else was. And maybe that's because I like sci-fi. I'm curious what other people who don't care about Dune going in feel if they're not like into films and sci-fi like I am. But I mean, Timothy Chalamet acted. That's a hard character. Out of, uh, yeah, that character. Here's, like, no here's an opinion more. about the books. Paul Lonely. is a boring as rock character in the books. Yeah. <laughs> and Timothy played that character about as interesting as you possibly could. Like, I was actually really impressed with his performance because the book is, Paul's uh, kind of, you know, it, <laughs> let me put it this way. Because the book's written in a, uh, is in a, is in a omniscient uh, narrator. We have all of his thoughts all the time. And because he's psychic, he's telling us the future. So Paul knows everything that's going to happen. And he's constantly like telegraphing it. And we're getting his head to like, it undercuts a lot of the drama. And I think the movie did a great job of like making it more dramatically interesting and like giving, but there isn't a lot there, Alexi. There, that's yeah. the reason. There's not a lot. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that like he did phenomenal with it to the point where I was like, oh yeah, you're right. He didn't, he probably didn't have anything to work with on the page really. Um, <laughs> yeah, Paul's, yeah. Flat, Paul's a flat character, but the situation is so good, right? Like It is very it's, good, uh, yeah. It's basically uh, the same plot of Game of Thrones. Is it? I need to think I mean, about the, that. The first, the first book, right? Mm. Yeah. Who's gonna? Who's gonna? Oh, okay. Yeah. Similar. Similar. There's similarities. There's similarities. Um, actually, it's kind of uh, because this came out in 1965. You could say it's the other way around, but really, I think George R. R. Martin was influenced by the War of the Roses more than uh, Dune. But uh, very War of the Roses. Yeah. yeah, the later um, Dune books are wild. Like they, <laughs> Frank Herbert, you have to admire the you have to admire the guy. He did not really give a damn about writing uh, a compelling narrative. He was all about <laughs> the philosophy. He was all about. He's like you know characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, whatever. Do you want me? Do you want to hear uh, an immortal worm god? talk about decaying empires for 200 pages. All right, let's have that. And spice and trade deficits and the golden path and future generations, genetic planning, assassin. You're, you're just, you're, when you're reading them, you're like, hey, who are these people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's happening? Sorry, I'm being a little too, too. Uh... They're good though. Oh. I really like them. I liked them as a kid. I really enjoyed them as a high schooler. So, for next week, Adam. Yes. I think we, sh I want to get back into like doing some TV analysis and some yeah. video analysis. So yeah. I'm going to name two shows that I have seen lately that I think are very fun that maybe we could cool. talk about, or if you have other ones that you think are interesting or if anybody here. I have, I have one I think I would really like to talk about. I have been watching Only Murders in the Building. And actually. Is season two I okay? I've not seen season two. I'm only on okay. season one, I guess. I didn't even know. I think Chris, not Chris Turner, Chris Hadley. Maybe you would want to check this out if you're doing a sort of... Anyway, for some reason, gut feeling. Might want to check it out. Um, and then also, Our Flag Means Death. I been... loved Our Flags Mean Death. I, I, yeah. I would talk about that. Totally. Yeah. Um, I Here's my problem with only murders in the building. I didn't believe 
any of the characters. No, it feels very... Um... I didn't believe any of them were real. I want to know what's... I mean, I watched the first season. <laughs> this is how you know how I feel about Wes Anderson. It felt very Wes Anderson to me. Oh, that's such an insult to Wes Anderson. He's such a good oh, writer. Oh, it is. <laughs> I think he's a <laughs> wonderful writer. First of all, I think Wes Anderson is deeply underrated as a screenwriter. Like, I think he's deeply underrated. Um, I think he's overrated as a director under for like for his visual style. And I think he's underrated mm -hmm. as a um, character writer. Interesting. That's my opinion. I'd have to think about that more. What was the other I, thing you wanted to do? Uh, I love Severance. <laughs> People here will know that. Yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the biggest Wes Anderson fan. Of Tarantino. You enjoyed um, uh, Grand Budapest. I enjoyed it. I know. Oh, I'm just. Oh, I'm not I, I also fan. think Wes Anderson. I think is a very different director than Tarantino. Like fundamentally, as a human being, like I'm just naming two that are that are like my two. Where I'm kind of like, eh. but uh, really? people disagree yeah. with me hard. He's so funny, he's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe comedies you go a long them. way for me. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I remember. I mean, listen. I also say like it's one of the filmmakers that made me fall in love with movies. That'll like, love it. you know, when I when I watched Rushmore for the first time, I like didn't know you could make movies like that. Like it was like, wow, you could make movies that feel like weird passion, weird cerebral passion projects. For just for yourself, That's it felt like Rushmore somebody was, was writing. Good. Rushmore is a good movie. I I think Life Aquatic by Steve Zizou and I think Moonrise Kingdom are kind of some weaker movies by his. And he's made weaker the, movies. Yeah, that was the one I saw first out of everything was Moonrise Kingdom. I think I've told you the movie theater broke halfway through. And, yeah, uh, it was a bad experience. So definitely, yeah. am... Grand Budapest is an amazing movie. I I really believe in that. Yeah, that was that was a good one. That was a good one. So. I think you dislike Tarantino more is what I'm really trying to say. Like, like oh, the, yes. I know you really dislike Tarantino. Yes. But I feel like Wes Anderson should be higher on that list personally. Um, maybe, maybe I'm just I'm stubborn. And you maybe are extremely you... stubborn. Extremely stubborn. <laughs> so I would be happy to talk about Our Flag Means Death and I'd be happy to talk about Severance. I think Severance is one of, the best pi one of the best pilots I've seen in a long time. Adam Scott is in it. it it's really good. Patricia okay. Arquette. So the basic concept, Lexi, science fiction, modern, oh. they found a way to separate your work self from your home self. So your work self has no memories beyond when you check in for work. It's sort of like, oh, it's a new personality comes on. And, they, and when you go back home for work, it's like you the moment you check out and check in, your consciousness fades and the other you comes on. And it's so good. It's so good. Okay, this actually seems like something I'd really, really like. No, it's so, really good. It's really the yeah. pilot, especially, is um, an excellent pilot. I would love to talk about this, um, but also and love, love our flagging oh. death. I loved our and death. Michelle. Yes, Better Call Saul and Abbott Elementary, both fantastic. Well, let's talk about all four of those shows sometimes soon. I, I think Abbott Oh yeah, I thought you meant it once. I was like, that's gonna be a little no, no, no. Better Better Call Saul, <laughs> I think I think there's a lot to talk about. I, I, I just watched an episode of it at the dentist. <laughs> so it's in my so this new dentist I met has like a TV screen on the ceiling. So like while they're working on you, you can like I, I was impressed. I was like, wow damn. What yeah, luxury. Sorry. I, I do wow. I just watched an episode of it and I was like, God, I forgot how good this show is. I need to watch the last season, um, the new, the season five, I mean. Um, Let's do Severance. I'm really curious. I have to watch it. And um, It's like good sci-fi. And they do such do a good job week. of exploring, ex explaining the rules of the world and like hooking you in the first episode. Because I know like I have a history of really enjoying shows that are like growers and you like shows that like prove their worth right away. Uh, so this is one of those. Let's do Severance. Hey. It seems like that won all the votes for next one. Let's do that. Awesome. Tokyo Vice. I've not seen that. I don't or know. Wait, are you talking to someone named Tokyo? Okay. I have not seen that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we it's, should definitely uh, do Better Call Saul too. We'll do everything. We'll do all of it. I'm going to write all these down and we will get to them all. But for next week, we're going to do the pilot of Severance. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Awesome. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, Adam, is there any last messages we need to say? That's it. No, we're good. All right.